Chapter One of the Ice Maiden and Other Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellie Cat. The Ice Maiden and Other Tales by Hans Christian Andersen. The Ice Maiden. Chapter One. Little Rudy. Let us visit Switzerland and look around us in this glorious country of mountains, where the forest rises out of steep rocky walls. Let us ascend to the dazzling snow-fields, and thence descend to the great plains, where the rivulets and brooks hasten away, foaming up, as if they feared not to vanish as they reached the sea. The sun beams upon the deep valley, it burns also upon the heavy masses of snow, so that after the lapse of years they melt into shining ice-blocks, and become rolling avalanches and heaped-up glaciers. Two of these lie in the broad clefts of the rock, under the Schreckhorn and Wetterhorn, near the little town of Grindelwald. They are so remarkable that many strangers come to gaze at them, in the summer-time, from all parts of the world. They come over the high snow-covered mountains, they come from the deepest valleys, and they are obliged to ascend during many hours, and as they ascend, the valley sinks deeper and deeper, as though seen from an air balloon. Far around the peaks of the mountains, the clouds often hang like heavy curtains of smoke, whilst down in the valley, where the many brown wooden houses lie scattered about, a sunbeam shines, and here and there brings out a tiny spot, in radiant green, as though it were transparent. The water roars, froths, and foams below. The water hums and tinkles above, and it looks as if silver ribbons were fluttering over the cliffs. On each side of the way, as one ascends, are wooden houses. Each house has a little potato garden, and that is a necessity, for in the doorway are many little mouths. There are plenty of children, and they can consume abundance of food. They rush out of the houses and throng about the travellers, come they on foot or in carriage, the whole horde of children traffic, the little ones offer prettily carved wooden houses for sale, similar to those they build on the mountains. Rain or shine, the children assemble with their wares. Some twenty years ago there stood here several times a little boy, who wished to sell his toys, but he always kept aloof from the other children. He stood with serious countenance, and with both hands tightly clasped around his wooden box, as if he feared it would slip away from him. But on account of this gravity, and because the boy was so small, it caused him to be remarked, and often he made the best bargain without knowing why. His grandfather lived still higher in the mountains, and it was he who carved the pretty wooden houses. There stood in the room an old cupboard, full of carvings. There were nutcrackers, knives, spoons, and boxes with delicate foliage, and leaping chamois. There was everything which could rejoice a merry child's eye, but this little fellow, he was named Rudy, looked at and desired only the old gun under the rafters. His grandfather had said that he should have it some day, but that he must first grow big and strong enough to use it. Small as the boy was, he was obliged to take care of the goats, and if he who can climb with them is a good guardian, well then indeed was Rudy. Why, he climbed even higher than they. He loved to take the bird's nest from the trees, high in the air, for he was bold and daring, and he only smiled when he stood by the roaring waterfall, or when he heard a rolling avalanche. He never played with the other children. He only met them when his grandfather sent him out to sell his carvings, and Rudy took but little interest in this. He much preferred to wander about the rocks, or to sit and listen to his grandfather relate about old times, and about the inhabitants of Meringen, where he came from. He said that these people had not been there since the beginning of the world. They had come from the far north, where the race called Swedes dwelt. To know this was indeed great wisdom, and Rudy knew this. But he became still wiser through the intercourse which he had had with the other occupants of the house belonging to the animal race. There was a large dog, a jola, an heirloom from Rudy's father, and a cat, and she was of great importance to Rudy, for she had taught him to climb. 
"'Come out on the roof,' said the cat, quite plainly and distinctly, "'for when one is a child and cannot yet speak, "'one understands the hens and ducks, the cats and dogs, remarkably well. "'They speak for us as intelligibly as father or mother. "'One needs but to be little, and then even grandfather stick can neigh "'and become a horse, with head's leg and tail. "'With some children this knowledge slips away later than with others, "'and people say of these that they are very backward.' that they remain children fearfully long. People say so many things. "'Come with me, little Rudy, out on the roof,' was the first thing the cat said, that Rudy understood. "'It is all imagination about falling. One does not fall when one does not fear to do so. Come, place your one paw so, and your other so. Take care of your four paws, look sharp with your eyes, and give suppleness to your limbs. If there be a hole, jump, hold fast. That's the way I do.' and Rudy did so, and that was the reason that he sat out on the roof with the cat so often. He sat with her in the treetops, yes, he sat on the edge of rocks, where the cats could not come. "'Higher, higher,' said the trees and bushes. "'See how we climb, how high we go, how firm we hold on, even on the outermost peaks of the rocks.' And Rudy went generally on the mountain before the sun rose, and then he got his morning drink, the fresh, strengthening mountain air, the drink that our Lord only can prepare, and men can read its recipe, and thus it stands written, the fresh scent of the herbs of the mountains, and the mint and thyme of the valleys. All heaviness is imbibed by the hanging clouds, and the wind sends it out like grape-shot into the fir woods. The fragrant breeze becomes perfume, light and fresh and ever fresher. That was Rudy's morning drink. The blessing bringing daughters of the sun, the sunbeams, kissed his cheek, and Vertigo stood and watched, but dared not approach him, and the swallows below from Grandfather's house, where there were no less than seven nests, flew up to him and the goats, and they sang, We and you, and you and we. They brought greetings from home, even from the two hens, the only birds in the room, with whom, however, Rudy never had intercourse. Little as he was, he had travelled, and not a little, for so small a boy. He was born in the Canton Valais, and had been carried from there over the mountains. Lately he had visited Stebach, which waves in the air like a silver gauze, before the snow-decked, dazzling white mountain, the Jungfrau. And he had been in Grindelwald, near the great glaciers, but that was a sad story. There his mother had found her death, and little Rudy, so said his grandfather, had lost his childish merriment. When the boy was not a year old, he laughed more than he cried, so wrote his mother, but since he was in the ice gap, quite another mind has come over him. His grandfather did not like to speak on the subject, but every one in the mountain knew all about it. Rudy's father had been a postilion, and the large dog in the room had always followed him on his journeys to the lake of Geneva over the Simplon. In the valley of the Rhone, in Canton Valais, Still lived Rudy's family on his father's side, and his father's brother was a famous chamois hunter and a well-known guide. Rudy was only a year old when he lost his father, and his mother longed to return to her relations in Berner Oberland. Her father lived a few hours' walk from Grindelwald. He was a carver in wood, and earned enough by it to live. In the month of June, carrying her little child, she started homewards, accompanied by two chamois hunters intending to cross the Gemi on their way to Grindelwald. They already had accomplished the longer part of their journey, had passed the high ridges, had come to the snow plains. They already saw the valley of their home, with its well-known wooden houses, and had now but to reach the summit of one of the great glaciers. The snow had freshly fallen and concealed a cleft, which did not lead to the deepest abyss, where the water roared, but still deeper than man could reach. The young woman, who was holding her child, slipped, sank, and was gone. One heard no cry, no sigh, naught but a little child weeping. More than an hour elapsed before her companions could bring poles and ropes from the nearest house in order to afford assistance. After great exertion they drew from the ice gap what appeared to be two lifeless bodies. Every means were employed, and they succeeded in calling the child back to life, but not the mother. So the old grandfather received instead of a daughter— a daughter's son in his house, the little one who laughed more than he wept, but who now seemed to have lost this custom. A change in him had certainly taken place in the cleft of the glacier, in the wonderful cold world, 
where, according to the belief of the Swiss peasant, the souls of the damned were incarcerated until the day of judgment. Not unlike water, which after long journeying has been compressed into blocks of green glass, the glaciers lie here, so that one huge mass of ice is heaped on the other, the rushing stream roars below and melts snow and ice. Within hollow caverns and mighty clefts open, this is a wonderful palace of ice, and in it dwells the ice maiden, the queen of the glaciers. She, the murderess, the destroyer, is half a child of air, and half the powerful ruler of the streams. Therefore she had received the power to elevate herself with the speed of the chamois to the highest pinnacle of the snow-topped mountains, where the most daring mountaineer had to hew his way in order to take firm foothold. She sails up the rushing river on a slender fir branch, springs from one cliff to another, with her long snow-white hair fluttering around her, and with her bluish-green mantle which resembles the water of the deep Swiss lakes. "'Crush, hold fast, the power is mine!' cried she. "'They have stolen a lovely boy from me, a boy whom I had kissed, but not kissed to death. He is again with men, he tends the goats on the mountains, he climbs up, up high, beyond the reach of all others, but not beyond mine. He is mine, I shall have him.' She ordered Vertigo to fulfill her duty. It was too warm for the Ice Maiden in summer time in the green spots where the mint thrives. Vertigo arose, one came, three came, for Vertigo had many sisters, very many of them, and the maiden chose the strongest among those that rule within doors and without. They sit on the balusters and on the spires of the steep towers. They tread through the air as the swimmer glides through water, and entice their prey down the abyss. Vertigo and the ice maiden seize on men as the polypus catches at all within its reach. Vertigo was to gain possession of Rudy. "'Yes, catch him for me,' said Vertigo. "'I cannot do it. "'That cat, that dirty thing, has taught him her arts. "'The child of the race of man possesses a power that repulses me. "'I cannot get at the little boy when he hangs by the branches over the abyss. "'I may tickle him on the soles of his feet "'or give him a box on the ear whilst he is swinging in the air. "'It is of no avail. "'I can do nothing.' "'We can do it,' said the ice maiden. "'You or I, I, I.' No, no, sounded back the echo of the church bells through the mountain, like a sweet melody. It was like speech, a harmonious chorus of all the spirits of nature, mild, good, full of love, for it came from the daughters of the sunbeams, who encamped themselves every morning in a circle around the pinnacle of mountains, and spread out their rose-colored wings that grow more and more red as the sun sinks, and glow over the high Alps. Men call it the Alpine Glow. When the sun is down, they enter the peaks of the rocks, and sleep on the white snow, until the sun rises, and then they sally forth. Above all, they love flowers, butterflies, and men, and amongst them they had chosen little Rudy as their favorite. "'You will not catch him! You shall not have him!' said they. "'I have caught and kept stronger and larger ones,' said the ice maiden. Then the daughters of the sun sang a lay of the wanderer, whose cloak the whirlwind had torn off and carried away. The wind took the covering, but not the man. Ye children of strength can seize, but not hold him. He is stronger, he is more spirit-like than we. He ascends higher than the sun, our mother. He possesses the magic word that restrains wind and water, so that they are obliged to obey and serve him. So sounded cheerfully the bell-like chorus and every morning the sunbeams shone through the tiny window in the grandfather's house on the quiet child. The daughters of the sunbeams kissed him. They wished to thaw him, to warm him, and to carry away with them the icy kiss, which the queenly maiden of the glaciers had given him, as he lay on his dead mother's lap in the deep, icy gap, whence he was saved through a miracle. End of chapter 1. Little Rudy. Recording by Ellie Cat.